Oh, without further ado, I want to thank Pastor Kilpatrick. Many of us know him from the Brownsville days. He's pastoring church of his presence in Alabama, but he's been a real fatherly encouragement to me in some of my darkest days. He's been one of the first that's called. He was one of the first people that contacted me as my father has uh, been diagnosed with terminal cancer in the last week, and he just texted and said he was praying, and it just has meant a lot on my young journey in the faith to have you stand with me. So thank you for coming this weekend and standing with the Altar Global. So will you guys stand to your feet, and let's welcome Pastor John Kilpatrick. making me want to move to North Carolina. <laughs> Y'all got a good spirit up here. Thank you, that's great. That should do good. Right there. Pull, pull this around this way. Yeah, right there. Great. Thank you very much. Well, are you ready for the word? Man, I like this church. When I came in, I saw a hippopotamus and a lion. And and I saw a white dove of the Holy Spirit. Man. You know, I love this church built like this because look what it says, ark. Not just Noah's ark, but an ark of the presence. That's what I'm going to be preaching on tonight is the glory. Does that sound good? Before I get started, let me just take just a moment. I have some MP3s with me, and we have all kind of series on these things. <clears throat> They're, these things house a lot of material. And um, I've got, I, I, you'll, you'll see it on the screen, but. You can, you can get this MP3 with a bunch of series on there, or either you can get them individually. But um, I just got through preaching recently a series entitled Marked. It talks about <clears throat> how in the tribulation, Satan will mark his people with a mark, the number of his name. And um, it'll be the number 666. But the Bible said that in the tribulation period, that he will seal his people. So in the tribulation, after the rapture's taken place and we're gone, uh, everybody in the tribulation is going to have some kind of a mark on them. The devil's crowd will have a mark. God's people will have a seal. And um, I just got through preaching this. This has been very, very popular. And this has been probably my most wonderful. I've enjoyed this so much. It was a wonderful pleasure to preach this. <clears throat> I've preached a lot of series through the years, but this one, all of them, I think turned out good. Really do. I'm not trying to push my product, but I'm dealing with the eyes of your understanding. And what I'm dealing with is the Bible says that Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus because Paul came up in Judaism and he was a Pharisee, really. But when God got a hold of him, he turned him and he became the Gentile, he became the apostle to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles didn't have any Judeo-Christian values at all. Of course, Christ hadn't come yet, but they didn't have any Judeo-Christian uh, leanings. They had nothing from Abraham. They had nothing from Moses. All the Gentiles were heathens. So when Paul got saved, he became the apostle to the Gentiles and he began to pray for them because God had opened Paul's eyes and he could see things. His understanding was opened. He was ministering to people that were saved, but they did not have understanding yet. So there was a gap between what Paul had received from the Lord where God was opening the eyes of his understanding, not just revelation, but opening the eyes of his understanding. 
And so whenever he prayed for the Ephesians, he said, Lord, I pray that you'll open up their eyes of understanding. And I deal with the difference between levels and dimensions. Many people have said, I want to go to the next level. I don't. I want to go into the dimensions that Christ introduced when he was here. Most levels take 100 or 125 years to accomplish. When the telegraph was first developed, it took over a hundred and something years for the cell phone. When the airplane was first developed at Kitty Hawk, it took about 150 years for the space shuttle. That was levels, that was informational levels and it took a while to develop those levels. Jesus instantaneously went into dimensions and you didn't have to wait. He introduced it by the wine at the marriage in Cana. And they said, you know, we didn't have to wait on this. It was instantaneous. When Jesus asked the disciples, he said, what do you have to eat here? They said, well, you know, we're going to have to send these people home. They have nothing to eat. And Jesus basically said this. He said, they said, well, we'll, we'll feed them. We, we need to feed them. And they said, well, do you want us to go to the store and buy something? You want us to go into town and buy something? See, that was their concept of how they dealt with issues. They dealt with issues over a time frame. We've got to go into town and we've got to get food, and it's going to take a while to prepare it to feed 5,000 people. Jesus said, well, what do you have here? Take an assessment of your, take an ass, assessment of your assets. And they came back and they said, well, there's a lad here that has a few loaves and a few fish. Jesus said, bring it to me. So Jesus <clears throat> said, make everybody sit down in groups of 50s. And then he said, bring me the bread and the fish. And then he had the 12 disciples lined up. And Jesus took the bread and he took the fish. And when he pulled a piece of bread off, another one replaced it immediately. When he broke the fish off, the cooked fish, another piece of cooked fish took the place of it. They fed 5,000 people and had 12 basketfuls left over. <clears throat> Didn't have to go buy it at the store. He took what was and multiplied it and it was more than enough. He entered in, he, he was showing us and what he said was, I want to show you how to do these things. I want to be like an Elijah to an Elisha. I want to show you how to do these things because I'm going to be gone. I'm going back to the Father. So I want you to watch me just like Elisha watched Elijah. I want you to watch me. And he said, whenever I'm gone, you can do these very things. And so what happened was he fed 5,000 with those loaves and the fish, and it was instantaneous. When Jesus heals somebody, today the way we think when it comes to divine healing, we think going to the doctor, getting assessed, diagnosed, cancer, tumor being removed, having major surgery, that's the way we think. And then the doctor says, well, you're going to be out of work for about three months. It's going to take three months for rehabilitation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the Bible said when Jesus came, they came, the sick came out of the territories around Jerusalem and Samaria, and the sick came and the infirmed, those with maladies, and they came. And Jesus touched them and healed them, and there was no incisions, there was no rehabilitation. They were healed instantaneously. He taught them, he taught them how to enter into a dimension of the supernatural. Now what faith is, is faith is the bridge in our lives that we cross over from the natural into the dimension of the supernatural. Faith is the bridge that you walk across. It takes you into the supernatural. Faith is not the supernatural, but it's the bridge that bridges the natural to the supernatural. I loved preaching this, and you can tell I'm trying to preach it right now. <laughs> Amen. Pastor, are you the pastor here? You the pastor? Who's the pastor? He's the pastor? Come here, pastor. I don't even know who the pastor is here. I don't know. 
Yeah. And then I just, I'm having this book re-released. It's called The Heavens When the Heavens Are Brass. You may have heard about this book. It's been real popular through the years. They're just re-releasing it, just that popular. So it'll be re-released in about two weeks, the end of June. And so I'd like to, we have those back there with us also. We also have the book on the fire that never sleeps between me and Dr. Michael Brown wrote this together. So, hey, I'm not going to take any more time talking about product. I've got better things to talk about. <laughs> Amen. Come on, Brother Tony. This is Tony Schauber. He's been traveling with me for 25 years. Man. <clears throat> Y'all see how handsome people are that surround me. You see that, don't you? Well, today, I want to minister to you. I want to minister on the glory. Can I have a book or something so I can sort of lift this up? I'm not used to these Episcopalian pulpits here. <laughs> I need something to put up underneath it to where it'll lean. Amen. You, what you got? Hey, buddy. Hey. Is that your cloak? Is that your mantle? Yes, sir. And your Bible? Yes, sir. It'll work. What's your name? Jared. Jared? Yes, sir. Hey, man. You own the jewelry store? What? No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Hey, man, I thought, hey, you know, racked up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to talk to you tonight about the glory of God. What happened at Brownsville, I was there from the get-go, so I know what I'm talking about. We prayed two and a half years for revival, <clears throat> and when revival came, the thing that was so shocking was I was raised in Pentecost, so I know Pentecostal, I know Pentecostal ways, I know Pentecostal preaching, I know the, the moving of the anointing, I know all that stuff, I've experienced it. But what really took me back on Father's Day of 95 was the dimension of the glory. That's something I'd never experienced. That's why people came from around the world. <clears throat> Brownsville grew and people from around the world began to come, not because of the preaching of Steve Hill, and he was a wonderful preacher, a powerful, passionate preacher, and I love him like my own brother, and not because of the worship of Lyndall Cooley, and Lyndall's my dear friend, my spiritual son, and certainly not because of me, I can promise you that, but people came and they experienced the glory, and they they soaked in the glory of God and just sat there and you'd look up at three o'clock in the morning and there'd be as many people in the church at three in the morning as there was when we started at seven <clears throat> and people would be coming in from all over the world with no advertisement we didn't even advertise it word of mouth people began to come from around the world why did they come because of the element and the dimension introduced of the glory now the glory had been something that had been really popular at the turn of the century with the latter rain people, the latter, the latter rain people in the early uh, 20th century. But that went off the rails a little bit. But what happened was I believe that God was introducing to the last day church, I believe that God was introducing or reintroducing to the last day church the presence of his glory. And I want to talk about that tonight. I have found out that what you talk about will come. If you talk trouble, trouble will come. If you talk sickness, sickness will come. If you talk lack, lack will come. If you talk healing, healing will come. If you talk glory, the glory will come. And I say, Lord, send your glory in North Carolina tonight. Somebody shout amen. Yeah. Come on. Woo. Yeah. So I'm going to read my, my text, and I'm in Exodus 33 and verse 13, or verse 18. And then I'm going to read Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 14. Two simple scriptures. Just listen carefully, and I'll get started. In Exodus 33 and 18, Moses said to the Lord, and now let me tell you about Moses. Moses was a sharp dude. He was the most powerful man that the earth has ever known beside Christ. Moses was a sharp man. He was the writer of the first five books of the Bible. He was nowhere around when the earth was made. 
and when God put man on the earth, but he wrote about it. He wrote the first five books known as the Pentateuch. And he was a powerful man. He met with God face to face. He was the friend of God. And he had been raised in the universities of Egypt. He was raised around the throne of Pharaoh. He used to crawl and learn to walk in the palace under Ra, Pharaoh, the sun god. And he was used to power. He was around pomp and circumstance. So he knew power. He knew the halls of power of the greatest nation on the face of the earth at that time, which was Egypt. Moses had seen it all. But when God called him to lead the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage into the land of Canaan, Moses said this. He said, Lord, I'm not going to go anywhere unless you go with me, unless your presence, unless your presence goes with me. And so he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. I have seen it all, but Lord, show me your glory. And then Habakkuk says, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, the knowledge of the glory as the waters cover the sea. Now somebody might say, well, Brother Kilpatrick, what are you doing out here traveling on the road? I have a wonderful church at home. My church is doing really well. It's prospering. God's blessing it. But I'm out here, and I'm mainly talking about the glory because I feel like in my heart that God has me out here talking about the glory before it ever shows up. But I just want to let you know, it's about to show up. It's about to show up. And I want to talk about it. I want to talk about it. I want to get you excited about it. And I'm trying to get, wherever I get invitations to preach, I usually preach this at least one time. Because I believe that the glory of the Lord is about to come. It said, Habakkuk said, that the earth shall be filled in the last days right before the coming of the Lord. This won't need to happen in the millennium because the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. It says that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory. What, what does that mean? It means it's going to be so pervasive, so thick, so powerful and so mysterious and so yearned for that the tongues of the nations will be talking about it from coast to coast, border to border. And Adam and Eve in the garden was always naked. They were always naked. But the reason they didn't recognize their nakedness is because they were clothed with the glory. And when they sinned and they bit into the forbidden fruit, the glory lifted off of them. And they were always naked, but now they felt their nakedness. How many of you knows when God clothes something with his glory, you're happy, you're satisfied, you're fulfilled, you're secure. You feel the warmth of the presence of God. But when they bit into that forbidden fruit and the glory lifted off of them, what happened was they began to reach for fig leaves or whatever else they could get their hands on to try to bring that feeling back. I've got news for you. You can't bring that feeling back only through the cross of Calvary and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. God in these last days is in the process of restoring the glory to the church before he comes back for it. So I want to make it clear tonight before I get too deep into the message that in, I'm in no way trying to put more value on anything more than the shed blood of Jesus because it's the blood of Jesus that's the most important thing in the whole world. I'm not trying to put more importance on the glory than I am on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Neither am I going to diminish or avoid presenting the importance of the value of the glory. It's certainly something that few people know about enough to really even preach on it. But the importance of the glory is going to be extremely relevant in the days to come. And it's going to be something you're going to need to think about. It's something you're going to need to be praying into. 
And it's something that I believe is going to sweep North Carolina. So I asked the Lord recently, I said, Lord, why all this interest and excitement in the glory? And the Lord said to me, didn't I say that my word, in my word, didn't I say that the latter house will be greater than the former? And I said, yes. So the next thing the Holy Spirit said, I want you to tell the people that the Holy Spirit is a person. But the glory is not a person. Many people interchangeably say glory and anointing. Don't ever do it because they're not the same. They're not even in the same ballpark. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third person of the adorable Godhead. The glory is not a person. The glory of God is not a place. The glory of God is an atmosphere. It's an environment. God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. But he does not manifest his presence everywhere. There were many nations back during the days of Moses. There was many nations back during the days of Jesus. But God only chose to manifest his glory and his presence through Israel. He did not manifest his presence through Rome. He did not manifest his presence through Egypt and other places like that. He only manifested his presence through his people. And Moses was the progenitor of the early church, which was known as the body of Christ as far as being under the atonement. So God's glory, the ark only dwelt in Israel. Even when they tried to take it into the camp of the enemy, their false gods would fall off and break their necks. Oh, I say, Lord, send your glory back to America. Send your glory back to America. And let everything that's of witchcraft and sorcery and false, let it fall off and break its neck. God, send the glory again to the United States of America. So the ark only dwelt in Israel and God would only manifest his presence to Israel through the ark. And when the ark was there, it usually manifested in two areas. The ark would manifest in a way called the truth and the spirit. The spirit and truth is the way God's glory would be felt when they would worship him in spirit and truth. And where God was continually honored and reverenced, that's where the glory would show up. Now, when God would reveal the glory, it could be felt in two ways. The glory could be manifest as Shekinah, and the Shekinah was his manifest presence to humans through physical phenomena known as fire, clouds, or a light that could be seen. The other way the glory was manifest was called the Kabod, K-A-B-O-D or K-A-B-O-U-D called the glory and it meant the weighty presence of the Lord. A weighty manifest presence that could be felt but not so much seen. It was a weighty presence that came that used to rest on Adam and Eve. So when Jesus came, the last Adam, he came to shed his blood on Calvary and to redeem us and to remit our sins so that we could know once again the presence of his glory. There's been very little emphasis down through the millennia on the glory of God. But in those last days, God is once again beginning to remind the last day church, get ready, get ready, get ready. The glory of God is coming. So the kabod of God, there were those of us there during the Brownsville revival that experienced what we would call the kabod, the weighty presence. It would usually come during worship, when Lindell would be worshiping. It would usually come during a time of waiting. And many times it would come during the preaching of the word. At times it felt like a comforting presence. At other times it felt like a therapeutic presence. At other times it felt like 
when it would come that you had no cares in the world whatsoever and that you had never had any cares, cares of the world. It was so comforting and it was such a glorious thing. And it would flow down the congregation and it would even flow down the aisles like an invisible river. I'm a big man, I'm six foot two and I weigh a little over 200 pounds. <clears throat> And uh, a lot of nights when we would leave the platform to go start praying for people after the altar call, the glory of God would be flowing down the aisles like an invisible river, and I'd have to actually take my foot like this and brace myself because as that invisible river was coming down the aisle, and Tony's here with me, he'll vouch for it, we'd have to really brace ourselves because it would just push you back down the aisle. It was a river of the glory of God. And listen, I want to just tell you this. I know that may be hard for you to believe, but I have no reason to come here and lie about anything. It happened. I'm telling you what happened, and I'm telling you I can't wait till it happens again. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So the anointing, let's contrast the anointing with the glory for a moment. Jesus said when he was here ministering under the anointing, he quoted Isaiah the first time he went to the temple to preach. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, has come upon me today in your sight and has anointed me to preach deliverance to the captives, etc., etc., etc." So Jesus began his ministry and he operated strictly under the anointing. So one day he said, who touched me? And when all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, you know the multitude is all around you here. And you say, who touched me? And here's what Jesus said, and this is so interesting. He said, somebody touched me because he said, I perceived that virtue has gone out of me. In other words, somebody had a need so great that when they touched me, it drained my batteries down. And the woman with the issue of blood had a dire need. And so when she touched him, she drew on that anointing and it drained him down. And he said, man, somebody touched me. And he looked and it was her. And when ministering under the anointing, you get tired. And when you minister under the anointing, you sweat. And you're tired and you're drained because the Spirit is using your humanity. But when we experience the glory... It's completely different. When we experience the glory, it's not us that's at work. It's God that's at work. And it's a, it's, a, it's a realm of rest. We don't do anything in the glory. And we don't need to touch anybody. We don't need to preach. We don't need to prophesy when the glory's there. People are being refreshed, and the minister himself should be refreshed. That's when you get your mind off of yourself and get your mind off everybody else and just soak in the presence of God. I want to say this, and I want to say it respectfully. I have a lot of friends that pastor seeker-sensitive churches, seeker-friendly churches, and I'm not against them. But that's not my bailiwick. I love Pentecostal power. I love the moving of the Holy Spirit. I love the glory I love tongues, and I love healing, and I love casting out devils. I mean, I just can't help myself. <laughs> and I really think, I really think that God has me on the road out here trying to remain Pentecostals. It's okay to be Pentecostal. It's okay to speak in tongues. It's okay to sing in the spirit. It's okay to deliver the captives. It's okay to run and glorify and rejoice yourself in the Lord. It's all right. It's okay to be. It's okay to be a fanatic, praise God. But I have a lot of friends that they go to they go to those kind of churches, you know, but here's what happens many times. They don't let the Holy Spirit move. He's bound and gagged over in the corner. The Holy Spirit's bound and gagged. And he's over in the corner. They're not going to let him do anything. They've got the service. 
And the second thing is, you know, they have a service at 9 o'clock. They have one at 1030, and they have one at 12 o'clock. And what that means is they get everybody in, they worship, they make their announcements, they receive the offering, and they have a lecture. I didn't say a sermon, I said a lecture. Because you don't have to have the anointing to give a lecture. But to preach, you've got to have the anointing of the Holy Ghost. So, so what happens is at 9 o'clock till 10.30, and then at 10.30, we've got to get them out, get them out, get them out, get them out. Got to get the parking lot emptied and get the next crowd in. And they come in, and then an hour and a half, get them out, get them out, get them out. Got to get the next crowd in. And by the time it's all over, you've had your singing, you've had your preaching, but God hadn't had time to do anything whatsoever. Listen to me. I remember an early Pentecost. One of the great things about the early Pentecostal services that I remember as a boy is there would be great preaching. The pulpit was a place where the preacher got up and thundered. It's where the preacher got up and he ruled and reigned behind that pulpit like a king sitting on a throne. He was a mighty man of God. He prophesied. He preached under a powerful anointing. And when he would preach, it would jab you in the heart. And you couldn't do anything but come to the altar. You couldn't do anything but be filled with the Holy Spirit to be delivered. There was power in the house. It wasn't psychological. It was called the anointing of the Holy Ghost. But I remember in those days when the preacher would get through preaching, I remember we'd pray for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I have a question. If we don't pray for people to receive the baptism in our church services, are they going to pray for them in the aisles at Kmart? Are they going to pray for them at the, uh, at the Elk Lodge or the Moose Lodge? No. Let the house of God return to being the house of God. It's where we pray for one another. It's where we hold one another up. It's where we encourage one another. But I remember after praying for people to receive the baptism, and I remember many times after praying for people to be delivered of demonic spirits, the people would come and they would sit by the hundreds in the front of the church, and they would just wait in the presence of the Lord. They would wait. It was a waiting time. What were they waiting on? They were waiting on the glory to show up. That therapeutic refreshing of the presence of God. Just a therapeutic refreshing. And they would sit there. Nobody prophesied. Nobody preached. Nobody prayed anymore for anybody to receive the Holy Spirit. Everybody just soaked in the presence of God. Let me tell you something. In the world that we're facing today, there's so much going on. We have got to have those times of waiting in the glory of God to be able to face what we've got to face in the coming days. So when we work, we work under the anointing, but when we rest, we rest in the glory. Let me talk about Moses for a few minutes. I gotta hurry, I didn't got sidetracked. I think Jared, I think his mantle's got, done got something going up here. I, I can feel it. Moses. Let's talk about Moses for a minute. Boy, he was something else. This guy was something. He was the friend of God. The bush burned. That was his first encounter with the holy God. The fire. It was the glory. That fire was the glory. That fire where the bush wouldn't be consumed, that was not a combustible flame like fire is a combustible thing that you burn like burning a field. This was holy fire. This was the glory. And when Moses met God at the burning bush, the Lord said, take your shoes off. And he experienced the glory. The first experience that Moses had with God was the glory. It cemented him and his future calling. It was in the presence that Moses met with the Lord and got instruction Revelation came to him of how to deliver two and a half million Jews from the strongest power and the strongest grip 
political grip in the world, Pharaoh and his tyranny. Moses was in God's presence. Moses' life was divided up into three different 40s. He was 40 years old, raised in Pharaoh's household, educated in their universities. At the end of that, he saw some Egyptians fighting with a Hebrew. Moses rose up, killed the Egyptians. He ran. The first 40 years of his life was 40 years where God showed him power, raw power, how to rule, how to have authority, how to operate in authority. He saw it firsthand as a child. His mother nursed him at her breast for the first three to five years of his life, but Pharaoh's daughter raised him in the confines of the palace. So Moses, the first 40 years of his life, got, a, got an image of power indelibly stamped in him of what power was all about and authority. When he slew the Egyptians, he had to run. Where did he run? He ran to the desert. Who did he meet? He met Jethro. Who was Jethro? Jethro was a shepherd. Moses would wind up marrying his daughter. For 40 years, God was going to take Moses and not have him in the halls of power anymore because he got that. Now he's going to put him with a shepherd. He's going to teach him how to shepherd God's people. He's putting him with a shepherd to see how to be tender with the people because Jethro would check the sheep when they'd come in in the evenings. He'd pull the bugs out of their wool. He would mend the places where they were bleeding. He would speak kindly to them. They knew his voice. He taught Moses by example what it means to be a shepherd. And then after that 40 years, the Bible says that Moses met God at the burning bush and God said, I want you to deliver my people out of Egyptian bondage. In other words, I want you to go back to the palace. There's a different Pharaoh there, but I want you to go back to the palace. I want you to go back to familiar territory. See, sometime God will have you in a place early in your life that you might not understand, but later in your life, he might send you right back to it with a different perspective. And he sent him back. And when he sent him back, he went in and he said to Pharaoh, because now he's not intimidated, he was raised there. He knew what Pharaoh was all about. He knew the fallacy of having that kind of power and just being a mere man. And he knew after he had had the encounter with God that he had more power than Pharaoh did. So God sent him right back into the halls of that power and he said, God said, let my people go. And what happened was he led two and a half million people out of Egyptian bondage into the wilderness. And when they got into the wilderness, here's what happened. This is where I want to spend just a few minutes. He led them across the Red Sea and they got in the wilderness and the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. He said, tell the children of Israel, tomorrow the glory comes. Tomorrow the glory shows up. Be looking for it. And Moses told everybody, he said, tomorrow the glory, God's sending the glory. Now here's what happened, listen to me. When they left Egypt, there were some small infants in the arms of mothers. When they left, Israel, when they left Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea, there were some little infants. Those infants grew up in that wilderness under the presence of that glory. And all those little children ever knew was <laughs> that fire flaming at night when they slept. <laughs> and they could see the flames of that fire of the glory of God every night. They grew up with that. And in the daytime, they could see the sunlight, but it was shielded so it wouldn't burn them. And they had air conditioning in the daytime because of the glory of God. Those children that left Egypt, many of them spent the next 40 years of their life under the glory. And when Joshua got ready to lead them into the land of Canaan, they didn't want to go. You know why? Because they got used to the glory. 
I pray that God gives us such a revival in these last days that we, won't, we don't want to part with the glory of God. That's where it's coming to, friend. <laughs> Moses led the children of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness. He had a whole, he had three 40s, 40, 80, 120. And after leading them for 40 years in the wilderness, it came time for him to die. And the Bible says Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. Now, you need to see that. Look at it on the screen. How did he die? Cancer? No. Tuberculosis? No. God had to tell him, Moses, die. <laughs> Moses, for heaven's sakes, die, would you? You know why? Because the Bible said his eye was not dimmed. And his natural forces was not abated. You know what it meant? When you've been under the glory, the glory keeps you in perfect health. When you've been under the glory, you can't die. I said, when you've been under the glory, you can't die. Just like the bush. Just like the bush can't be consumed, you can't die in the presence of the glory of God. And God said, now your, your compatriot here, Joshua, has got to lead them into the land of promise. But you've got to die. So I'm giving you the command, son, die. Just lay down and die. <laughs> but look what he said. He died according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor. But no man knows of his sepulcher to this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died, his eye was not dim. In other words, he didn't have glasses or contacts. And his natural forces was not abated. I'm not going to tell you what that means. I'll wait on you. It's worth it. His body was under the glory for so long. He had no hearing problems. <laughs> I knew you'd get it finally, yeah. <laughs> yes. So he had no hearing problems. He had no sight problems. He was still able to have children at 120 years old. Why? Because he was in the glory. You see, when you're in the glory, there's no friction. It doesn't wear you out. Oh, oh, my God. I don't know if you heard what I just said. There's no friction. It don't wear you out. You're renewed constantly in the presence of the glory. So the Bible says this. It says that in the glory, the children of Israel, their clothes wouldn't wear out, neither would their shoes. In other words, you can't die in the glory. And when you're under the glory, even the threads of your clothes won't wear out. That's bad news for the women. <laughs> Honey, I need a new dress. No, you don't. No, you don't. Uh-uh, you ain't going to fool me. But look what he said. Moses called all Israel to him in Deuteronomy. And he said unto all of Israel, You've seen all that the Lord did before you, your eyes in the land of Egypt, unto Pharaoh, and unto all of his servants, and unto all this land. And he said, The great temptations which your eyes have seen, and the sighs, and signs and the great miracles and yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear until this day he said Moses said I led you 40 years in the wilderness your clothes haven't waxed old and the shoes that's on your feet have not waxed old Moses was laying down to die and he told Israel You've been in the glory. And God has cared for you tenderly. The reason Adam had to be removed from the garden when he sinned, the Bible says that God put angels there with flaming swords. The reason Adam and Eve had to be removed from the garden is because the glory of God was still in the garden but just wasn't on Adam anymore. It still wasn't on Adam and Eve. They had sinned. And here's what the devil was trying to do. Listen, it's a blessing to be able to die. It's a blessing. I know the Bible says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, but just listen. 
when Adam and Eve bit into the forbidden fruit, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they bit into it. And as soon as their teeth broke the skin of that forbidden fruit, death set in. It was a done deal right then. Death set in. They were under a curse. What the devil was trying to do is get them to bite that fruit, and then he was trying to maneuver them over to the tree of life. And if they would have eaten the tree of life in that damned condition, they would have never been able to have died. So God said to the angels, put angels over there at the tree of life to keep them, lest they eat and live forever, is what the Bible says, lest they eat and live forever in that damned condition. So the Bible says all the days of Adam was 930 years. He lived almost as old as Methuselah. Methuselah lived 969 years. But he lived almost, he lived 930 years. Why did he live so long? Because he had spent so much time in the presence of the Lord. And in the glory, a sinless atmosphere in the garden. That even after he bit into that fruit, him and Eve, it took him a long time to die. You can take a fish out of water and he'll flip and flop for a long time. Same way it is with the glory of God. Let's talk about Elijah just for a minute. Did you know right now, right now at this moment, Elijah is in heaven in his natural body. Elijah is in heaven right now in his natural body. He was caught up in a chariot and Elijah told Elisha, he said, if you see me when I go, he said, you'll get a double portion. So the angel came. God sent a taxi after Elijah, <laughs> a heavenly taxi. And the chariot came down in the sky, and it was a glory chariot, and it was glory horses. Not horses like you'd see out here in the pasture somewhere in Kentucky or North Carolina or Georgia. These were glory horses. These were chariots of fire and horses of fire. When we come back with Christ at the second coming of Christ, we'll be riding horses also. They'll be glory horses. They'll be horses just a different kind. And so God sent a chariot after Elijah and somehow it's like a vortex sucked him up and set him right down in that chariot and the angel hit them horses and they went straight up and all of a sudden as they were going up Elijah said oh I forgot to drop my mantle and he leaned over and dropped his mantle and it floated down took it forever to float down and Elisha went over and picked it up and the first thing he wanted to do is, is see if that thing lost any power he went right over to the Jordan and smote it and the Jordan parted for him just like it did for Elijah but Elijah is still in his natural body to this day. He still has his teeth. He still has his eyesight. He still has his hearing. Elijah, Samuel was Israel's most beloved prophet. Isaiah was the most profound prophet because he was a statesman. He wrote prolifically like a statesman. But Elijah was the mightiest prophet that Israel ever had. And so in heaven today, he's still in his body and he has to come back in the tribulation period. And he'll be one of the two witnesses. And he'll have to give his life because it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. And then on the third day, his body will be resurrected in the streets of Jerusalem. But as of right now, he's still in heaven. He can't die in heaven. Does he have to go for a checkup in heaven every year? No. He, doesn't, he can't die because in heaven you can't die. You know what your grand folks used to say that was Christians? They used to say, when I die, I'm going to glory. Remember they used to say, when I die, I'm going to glory? You know what they were saying? It's when I die, I'm going to glory land. I'm going where the glory is. Nothing shall enter that cause any harm, and no, no pain, no separation, no suffering. And so the Bible says that to this day, he's still there in his natural body and he'll come back during the great tribulation. 
Now, let me just tell you real quickly about this, and I'm just going to touch on it. But it was Elijah and his servant that were facing the army for Syria. Israel was protected by the glory. God sent the glory to protect Israel. <clears throat> and so Elisha said to Gehazi, he said, son, don't be concerned about that great army out there. No, I don't be concerned about it. He said, it's not that big of a deal. He said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. The mountains were full of the glory and it manifested. And Elijah just said, Lord, open Gehazi's eyes that he can see really what's going on. And when God removed the veil off of his eyesight, he saw the, the mountains full of the glory of God. I wonder, as we get closer to the coming of Jesus Christ, I wonder what's going on all around us and we can't even see it. I have a feeling that the glory of God is going to manifest before Christ comes in Washington, D.C. I have a feeling it's going to manifest in New York City. I've got a feeling it's going to manifest in all the United States of America before the Lord comes back. Oh, God, send your glory to America one last time. Somebody shout amen. Now, let me close. I'm not going to have time to get through with everything. I've gone too long already. How long have I been going? I got five minutes left? I got 10 minutes left? <laughs> what can I say? I got 10 minutes left. Man. Let me close. Let's talk about Lucifer for a minute. Let's talk about Satan. You ever thought about why Satan hates you so bad? You ever thought about why he hates churches like this so bad? Other churches he don't hate. Other churches he's comfortable with. But why does he hate churches like this? With a pastor by the name of Jeremiah. Why does he hate churches like this? Because in heaven, he was an archangel, and it seems by everything that we can read about him, it seems that he was the choir director in heaven. Now, that can't be proven, but it said he had tabrets and pipes. He had some kind of mechanism that he was created with that whenever he would, he, he could make sounds and had ability to make noises and sounds and melodies that was worthy of worship in heaven. His name was Lucifer and Lucifer is a Latin word and it means, it comes from the Latin Vulgate and it means light bringer or light bearer. And it says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? And the Hebrew word there is Hallel, and it means the shining one of the morning star. He was definitely associated with God's glory, and he was constantly in the presence of God's glory before he fell. And when he was cast out from heaven, he's now named the Prince of Darkness. Not light bearer anymore, now he's the Prince of Darkness. He fell from grace. He's the prince that tries to destroy or attacks anybody that's going after the glory. So Satan seeks to deprive saints of the knowledge and the revelation of God's rest and God's renewal that's found only in his glory. That's why he will fight churches just like your church. But could I go ahead and tell you something? I have fought him for years. And I've gone after the glory all of my life. And God sent the glory to our church, and I got to host it for five years at Brownsville. And I'm going to tell you something. It's worth every fight. It's worth every fight. It's worth every attack of the devil. Don't you back up one bit. Go after God. It's worth it all. Now, let me, let me give you this before I close. This is my last point. Somebody say, he's closing. Not quite. 
It came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter, James, and John with him, went up to a mountain to pray. And look at this. Interesting. As he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. Let's stop right there. The only way that the disciples had ever known Jesus was anointed. That's the only way they'd ever known him. Anointed. Now, it said the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. That means the fabric of his robe was sparkling. And behold, there talked with him two men, which was Moses and Elijah. Oh, who did I just get through talking about? Moses and Elijah. Both were glory men. When he's on the Mount of Transfiguration, he left the anointing, and now he's being transfigured before them into the God's glory. His, his, his countenance was altered. The fashion of his countenance was altered. Now you have Elijah and you have Moses. And it said, they appeared in glory, and they speak of his, they were speaking about him about to go to Jerusalem and his decease, how he was going to be killed. But Peter and they that were with him, now look at this, they were heavy with sleep. You know why they were heavy with sleep? Is because they were still in their natural bodies. And when the glory came, they got real sleepy. Why? Because it's so therapeutic and so peaceful. That's where sleeping in church came from right there. <laughs> and it said they, when they were awake, they saw his glory. Oh, my God, can you imagine being there that day and you're waking up? And <sighs> it said when they awoke, they saw his glory. And the two men that stood with him. And while he thus spake, there came a cloud that overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into that cloud. That cloud was the glory also. It was a glory cloud. It was an atmosphere of glory. It was a cloud. It was not a threatening cloud with lightning and thunder. It was a cloud of glory, a mighty cloud of joy. And there came a voice out of the cloud that said, This is my beloved son. Hear him. And so Moses and Elijah, the two men who had experienced the glory in the Old Testament, now in the glory, they're there with Jesus and they're seeing all this and they're experiencing all this. But I want to go back to this just for a moment before I close. It said, it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony, Moses' hand, and Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone. Now let me stop right there. The Bible said that Jesus' garments, the fabric of his garments, glistered. It didn't say glistening. One, one translation says glistening. The other one says glistering. And it said that Moses' skin of his face, the skin of his face shone. It shone. You know, humans are the only ones that has a countenance. No other animal has a countenance. A hippopotamus has no countenance. A donkey has no countenance. A horse has no countenance. A dog has no countenance. A countenance is this many square inches right here that God made man. And everybody on the face of the earth with just this many square inches, they all look different. Everybody looks different. And the countenance is your ability to show forth coming out of your face what's going on in here and when you've been born again you don't really have to tell anybody because your countenance changes you can be walking down the street in New York City and rub shoulders with somebody or be on the subway with somebody and look and you can see in their face that they know Jesus you can see it you can look and you can tell people that serve the devil you can tell their countenance Reveals they've got a spirit of death on them, they're troubled. But the Bible said about Moses, it said his skin was shining to the point 
that they had to go up and put a veil over his face so that when he talked to the people, he came down from the mountain, talked to the people, he had a veil covering his face. That glory got in his skin. Can't you see now when we get to heaven why we're going to have to have a glorified body? Because this body wouldn't hold up in no time under the presence of the glory of God. And the Bible said, we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead shall change you from a mortal into immortality. Come on, somebody, give God glory today. Okay, so this is my really last point. I promise, three more minutes. So how do you increase the glory in your life? When the glory comes, how do you increase it? Now let me tell, you, let me tell all of you something in closing today. I know if you're like I am, I have been through hell backwards many times. I have been fought like you would not believe by devils, bull demons. I have gone through stuff that my wife has said to me so many times, honey, I don't know of another preacher that goes through what you go through. And I'm not trying to get you pity. I'm just trying to tell you, if you're going to be a man of God and you go after God, you're going to be fought. But it's worth it all. So, here's what the Bible says in Corinthians 4.17. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. Now, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. It works for us to increase the weight of glory in our life. What does? The things we go through. When you go through hell, rejoice because it means your glory quotient is about to be increased. That's what it means. So, when you go through hell, you know, don't say, oh my God, here it comes again. No, just say, glory to God, oh my God. I don't know how I can take no more glory. <laughs> I don't know how I can take it, Lord. Brenda, y'all just pray for me that I'll be able to handle the glory that's about to come on me. But the Bible says this. It says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, what Paul was saying, and Paul had been just at the point of death many times. They beat the living stuffings out of him. I mean, they just about killed him many times. You know what he called it? Light afflictions. Why did he call it that? Because in the presence of the glory, it is a light affliction. It can't measure, it can't compare to the presence of God. So let me close tonight by saying this. When you're going through things, don't seek pity. Don't seek attention. Instead, yield what you're going through. Just yield to the Holy Spirit and realize that the things that you're going through is going to work for you to increase that load of glory in your life. I ask you this question as I close. How many of you want a fresh touch of the glory of God in your life? Stand up with me, if you will. I want you to lift your voice. I want you to lift your hands. And I want you to call out to God, Lord, send your glory. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I pray that the message that you just received challenge you and encourage you. I do want to go into a time of prayer, but before I do that, I want to give you an opportunity to sow a one-time gift into our ministry. Uh, there's going to be a number pop up on your screen, a link in the comment section, or if you're desiring to do something further, you know, so many people around the world desire to participate with the Ultra Global Movement. We'd love to give you an opportunity to do that. That link is also going to be down in the comment sec section, being a part of our partner family. Let's pray now. God, thank you for those who have watched today who you've refreshed and challenged and encouraged. Lord, we lift up the prayer requests. We lift up the gifts, the partners that are even joining right now. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in the earth. You're readying your bride for your coming. You're bringing in a harvest of souls. And Lord, you're touching even the prayer requests being offered right now. 
We just ask all these things in the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Thank you so much.